Hi, welcome back to Biological Membranes presentation 9 for OCR Biology. Today we're going to think about passive movement, so in other words, movement through membranes. Last time uh, we spoke, uh, we considered an exam question, and a few of these exam questions said, have a think about that. Um, so the answer to the name of the model should be obvious. It's the fluid mosaic model. Remember, this is the fluid with a mosaic of proteins in. And then name the parts A, B, C, and D. It's a bit trickier. Some of the, this question uh, requires you to think a little bit. Um, lots of students will get caught out by talking about A. A, if you're thinking about phospholipids, or you could say a phospholipid layer. Don't say bilayer because that's a bilayer up to there. Only that is one layer. Yeah, it's pointed to one layer thick. B, cholesterol molecule. That should be pretty obvious, the cholesterol distributed throughout. C um, is a glycolipid, so it's a, gl glyc um, a carbohydrate group joined to a lipid molecule or a phospholipid. And then D, well, again, you've got carbohydrate chain joined to a protein, so it's a glycoprotein. So why do cells need transport? What's the point of cells being able to transport substances? Well, we need to think about what they need it for. And obviously they need glucose and oxygen to come in for respiration they need to get rid of waste materials, for example, carbon dioxide. And they need to excrete or secrete the substances that they have made. So enzymes, hormones, neurotransmitters, many of these cells, that might be their primary function. They're designed to produce and make such a molecule. So therefore, they need to uh, secrete them to outside the cell where they might be the, actually be used. Because sometimes these uh, substances are not always used in the cell itself. So thinking about the key ways in which substances can move through the membrane, uh, remember that these membranes are described either as partially permeable or selectively permeable because they control what substances enter and exit the cell. Now, obviously, it depends on the nature of the molecule itself as to how easy it is to move through. Uh, we're going to consider today diffusion uh, and then the separate presentations which cover active movement and osmosis and water potential. So diffusion should be fairly straightforward. You've learned that low down in school. Uh, diffusion is the net movement of particles from a region of high concentration to a low concentration. Now the new bit in the definition I suspect is probably this idea of net movement, in other words an overall gain of movement. Remember that molecules or particles are always moving randomly, so gas particles and liquid particles are in constant motion. Sometimes the particles will be more over here, sometimes they'll be more over there. But this is talking about the overall gain over a period of time. We also talk about the fact that they're moving down a concentration gradient, so in other words from more concentrated to less concentrated. Down is better than with, I think, as a description because it's making it really clear that it's going from higher to lower concentration. Diffusion and the other things that we're going to talk about today are both examples of passive transport. In other words, no energy is required. So we don't need energy from ATP. We don't need energy from respiration. It will happen. It's a purely physical process. Um, there are lots of examples of where diffusion might take place. Gas exchange in lungs. So oxygen diffusing from the alveoli into the blood capillaries or carbon dioxide diffusing from the blood into the alveoli. You could think about movement in cells, so oxygen diffusing from the blood to body cells or carbon dioxide moving from the cells to the body. I'm sure you can think of other examples. Don't forget plant examples as well. Think about oxygen and carbon dioxide when they move, which direction they move. So carbon dioxide diffusing in, oxygen diffusing out. Water vapour is another substance that can diffuse. See if you can think of some more examples. So the nature of the substance will dictate how easily it moves in. So because the phospholipid is nonpolar and hydrophobic, it might act as a barrier to some substances. Nonpolar molecules with no charge, like oxygen, carbon dioxide, can easily diffuse through as can lipid soluble substances. So anything that is lipid soluble or steroid based, that can easily move through the cell membrane because they're made of a similar type of material. 
Polar molecules, which are small, can diffuse across, but very slowly. Charged particles have to have a, a pathway by which they can move through. They can't move through unless they are supported or helped to move through in some way. So in other words, through a channel port protein or a pore protein. Um, we're going to skip ahead to what affects the rate of diffusion, uh, thinking about what makes diffusion go faster. So increasing the temperature, more, the higher the Ke standing for kinetic energy there, the higher the temperature, the more movement energy the particles have got. So therefore, the faster the uh, particles move through a membrane. Concentration gradient, if you've got lots of really high concentration here and a very low concentration there, it will move up rapidly to fill the gap. Steering is only relevant on an experimental basis, so if you're doing an experiment and you are steering it, that might increase the rate of diffusion. We're not relevant in biological situations outside of an experiment. Um, increasing surface area, again, remember your default biology answer, a highly folded to give a large surface area. Large surface area increases the rate, so for example, in red blood cells and epithelia and so on. If you've got a big surface area, it uh, allows more surface to, for diffusion to occur across. Uh, the distance, so me membranes are often thin. Think of capillary walls, for example, are only one cell thick. That, the thinner the, the wall is or the thinner the membrane is, the faster substances can diffuse across it. Similarly, Small molecules will move faster than big molecules. So tiny little gas molecules will move uh, a lot slower than larger molecules like glucose or amino acids, for example. I'm going to skip some of that for now. We'll come back to that later. Uh, dis facilitated diffusion. Let me uh, begin at the start of this uh, animation. Substances need ways in which they can get into uh, or across a cell membrane. You think about the, this is inside the cell, it's outside the cell. Here we've got a cholesterol molecule, we've got our phospholipids uh, with our hydrophilic heads and our hydrophobic fatty acid tails. And obviously this is an intrinsic or an integral protein with a channel or pore running through it. So facilitated diffusion just means, facilitated means helped or supported. So in facilitated diffusion, some uh, proteins have channels or pores through them, and that means that molecules can pass through. Let's say it's something that isn't lipid soluble and has a charge, it can't get through this bit here, so it, it can only go through where there is a pathway. So inside the protein, there may be no charge or less charge, so it's easier for the charge substances to move through, uh, so it allows them to move through. So ions, for example, will easily diffuse through. Uh, it could be in both directions. If there's a higher concentration here, a low concentration here, some substances can move in, or the substances can move out. This is just an open pore that allows movement in either direction. It's just a pathway through which things can take place. You can have what we call gated channels, which open and close depending on um, sort of binding of a particular receptor to it, for example, or if there's a change in voltage. You can have nerves, for example. This is a particular way that you think uh, these, um, this process can work. Diffusion can happen uh, in nerves only when certain channels are open. Uh, and it helps to build up a, a concentration of charge. Finally, or the third sort of uh, thing we're thinking about is carrier proteins. So different from channel proteins, whether there's a channel or a pore, carrier proteins um, bind to a particular particle they're trying to bring in and then they change shape. So let's watch this one again. Um, here we've got our carrier protein, the big pink thing. The molecule that we're trying to pass through joins with that protein, it changes shape. As it changes shape, it then can move through the membrane and then that in a turn triggers another shape change. So the shape change is being triggered by the presence of the molecule itself. As the particle or molecule binds to the uh, protein, uh, the protein changes shape, it makes it flex, it makes it release that molecule in uh, to, through the other surface, and then that ch shape changes again. So facilitated diffusion uses either carrier proteins or channel proteins. Let's uh, talk, let's make sure we're clear on the differences. We've got simple diffusion for things, gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide, which are small and non-polar, and lipid-based materials that can easily move through the phospholipid. 
channel uh, proteins and facilitated diffusion ions like sodium and calcium, so smaller ions which are have high charge, whereas carriers tend to be used for bigger molecules, amino acids and glucose, for example, will be things which would be used with carrier proteins. Um, at the end here is an exercise. Uh, for those of you in school, you'll be able to have a go at doing this. Uh, you'll be able to click on the uh, different choices and have a go at answering those. Let's just skip back now to something that's going to be relevant to some practice work that some of you are going to be doing, thinking about um, membranes and temperature. Now, the experiment you're going to be doing is looking at how uh, changing the temperature will affect the release of a particular colour called betalane from beetroot. Uh, the more you heat it, the more betalane must like to leak out. And the movement of betalane is by diffusion. Now, we're thinking about moving through a partially permeable membrane. The beta lane is normally kept within a cell within the vacuole. And the vacuole obviously is surrounded by a layer of membrane, what we call the tonoplast. So if you heat it, it starts to gradually uh, affect the membrane until more and more beta lane leaks out, in other words, more pigment leaks out. So higher temperatures make more beta lane uh, escape. The molecules are moving faster, so therefore, they can, if they move faster, they can get out more easily. Uh, the heating effect also affects the phospholipids, makes them sort of move slightly apart. So it's giving them the opportunity to move through. Uh, proteins that can be in the uh, membrane are less stable. So if you heat proteins up, they break down. We know that as denaturation. In other words, the shape, the shape of the protein has been irreversibly changed. In proteins, we have primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. The tertiary structure is bonds between different side groups, uh, and some of those are quite vulnerable to temperature changes in particular. And once those are broken, it makes the protein uh, unfold, it loses its shape, if it loses its shape, it loses its functionality because it's the shape that often gives a protein a particular function. So. Denaturing is uh, the action of heat on uh, proteins is caused by shape changes. Just a little think about uh, adaptations of extreme environments. Here's what we call a black smoker, uh, where the temperatures might be extremely high. You've got what we call thermophilic bacteria that live near there. They're adapted to living in high temperature conditions. Uh, so organisms like that may have cell membranes that have uh, ability to withstand higher temperatures. So, and it tends to be increased cholesterol levels that increases temp uh, temperature stability. So more cholesterol makes the membrane more stable, but less fluid as a result. So there's kind of a balance point between membranes and temperature. Now I'm not gonna go on too much about the details of uh, the beta lane experiment. It's gonna be something we'll be doing in the next couple of weeks. So it's for something, uh, that I want to pick up actually in lab time. That concludes today's presentation. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening.